Good morning. Did you have your Bibles? Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew is the first book of what we call the New Testament. The Bible has two sections, the Old Testament, 39 books uh, before Christ came to earth. The New Testament is the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry, his ministry on earth, and the beginning of the church. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 this morning. It's an honor to be uh, with you again at Schindler Drive. Uh, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Herb and uh, Herbert, for the music and the great worship uh, that we've had um, this morning. Um, great stuff. And, uh, you know, some of us as, as um, college football fans didn't get really excited yesterday, Herb. Thanks for bringing that up. So anyway, um, we may be excited the season's over. So I told my wife yesterday, that's it. I'm not watching the Florida Gators play again this year. I think that's funny. Anyway, so we're going to talk in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to move to Scripture. It's much safer and funner. Anyway, that's really bad grammar, but whatever. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to uh, look at, at really what I like to, at what I believe and what I know is, is one of the, gr- the greatest speech or sermon of all time. And throughout history, teaching events, speaking events uh, have been uh, kind of memorable occasions. We even have uh, now, if, if YouTube is still kind of a new thing, it's not real old, but YouTube and the TED Talks and, and so on and so forth are, are very popular. Popular. But there are very, uh, there's a few that uh, speeches or talks, so to speak, that just stand out to people. Uh, a few of those, let me just read, I'll read some uh, portions of a few. Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. John F. Kennedy Jr.'s first inaugural address. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. If you're a sports fan... You've heard of the Vince Lombardi, what it takes to be number one speech. Winning is not a sometimes thing, it's an all the time thing. You don't win once in a while, you don't do things right once in a while, you do them right all the time. Winning is a habit, unfortunately so is losing. A few years ago at the Southern Baptist Convention, the president of now, uh, the now president of our International Mission Board uh, preached a great sermon that still to this day is considered to be one of the greatest sermons ever uh, delivered at the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, David Platt, I believe it was 2009 or 2010. But this morning I, I want to talk to you what I subscribe to this. As those of us that believe in Christ, that those of us who have gotten to the place in our life where we've realized that we are sinners separated from God. That apart from Jesus, there's no alternative to heaven. There's no route, there's no way, there's no path. But because of Jesus, because of the work that he did on the cross, because of the fact that he came, lived a sinless life and died a criminal's death for you and for me on a tree... Because of that truth, we believed in that truth, we believe in our heart that He is Lord, we confess with our mouth that He is Lord, we will be saved. And because of that, if we are a believer in that this morning, the greatest sermon ever preached, the greatest sermon ever communicated, the greatest talk, so to speak, that, and I believe that kind of does a disservice to the weight of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but the greatest sermon ever communicated is recorded for us in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Gospel uh, of Matthew records this message. At the beginning of it, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says this, When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, then he began to teach them. The reality is he was specifically at this time, he drew back, and initially his goal was to teach and to help the disciples grow. Those, the word disciple has the meaning of apprentice, uh, a learner, one who's trying to be like the teacher. So these people were striving, these disciples were striving to be like Jesus, and what a great example for that today for us. But the reality is, 
when we are striving to be like Jesus, we, even though Jesus is teaching to the disciples, he, our message and how we live our life is not contained just to those who are Christ followers. Yes, as a church, we come together. We can take the example of the early church. The church in Ephesus is a great case study where they met every day in homes and came together corporately as believers to encourage each other to go live on mission for Jesus. That as a church, as Schindler Drive, the reality is, yeah, we come together to encourage the believers. And at the end, we're going to clap to be sent out to the mission field. But our lives... The way we live and the way we walk doesn't just affect, doesn't just impact believers in Christ, but it impacts non-believers as well. So as we look at this, this Sermon on the Mount, this great address, this great sermon where Jesus, he, he's talking about some generalities, but he also gets into some specifics. And just a few things that he talks about. He, he deals with how we should live, how we should be sought through the earth. How he addresses adultery and divorce. He addresses going the extra mile, what he calls the second mile for someone. He talks about loving your enemies. He deals with finances on how we should give. He also deals with where our treasure should be, that our treasure shouldn't be on this earth, but our treasure should be stored in heaven. He talks about how we deal with anxiety. He also deals with how we should or shouldn't judge one another. But I'm going to focus this morning, what we're going to do here in the next few moments is talk about a subject that I think we neglect. We're going to talk about a subject where Jesus teaches how we should do it, and then he gives a great example. And that discussion, that, that specific focus of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' address and instructions on how we should pray. See, the reality is, we, if we look at all the spiritual disciplines and all the different things that we can do, we neglect prayer probably the most. I want to answer just a few things uh, as we kind of look at, at Jesus' instructions on how we should pray in verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. He says this, Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. There's a few things I think that we can learn from just... His instructions on how we pray. When Jesus says how we pray, a few things. I don't think he's saying praying publicly is a bad thing. I don't think that he's addressing saying that praying publicly is bad. But what I think he is saying is this. Praying public can be a good thing if it's done in the right context. By going into a private room and, and, and having that habit of praying, we remove the self-seeking motives. We remove the desire for, look how good I can pray, and we're going to just be alone with the Father. We also see this, the second instruction, pray without babbling. He, he's getting to the heart of the matter. He doesn't want us to just be searching for words to be eloquent. He wants us to be alone seeking God. Spend alone time with the Father. In his book, Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, D.A. Carson asked a few questions that have to do with our personal private life. And I think we should answer them. He says this, Do we pray more frequently and more fervently when alone with God than we do in public? Are we passionate about spending time with the Father? As believers in Christ... The veil was torn. We have direct access to the Father. Are we more passionate about being alone with Him and getting to know Him and align our hearts with His? Is, here's another question, do I love the secret place of prayer? You know, I know we talk about, and, and I have a feeling, there's no doubt, I, 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 I've never sat under Ben's teaching or Michelle's teaching or, or when they're with their students and, and the children, but I'm sure I'm going to go on a limb here, Ben. Don't, don't, don't let me be wrong. 
I am sure that at some point they've talked to the students about spending a long time with God, whether it's quiet time, devotional, whatever. And it's not because we're trying to get people to check off a box. And it's not students it's just trying to get you to be alone and, and check a box off for the children to teach those habits while they're young. The, the focus is, is this. The focus is so you will develop the habit to be alone with God and value the private place of prayer with God. He asked his last question. He says this, is my public praying the overflow of my private life? Here's the biggest question. D.A. Carson didn't write this. It's my question. Are we praying at all? Are we praying at all? LifeWay released a study, and, and, you know, we can make numbers say whatever they want. But LifeWay released a study that said 90% of believers spend less than five minutes a day praying. And a huge percentage spend zero minutes. Do we spend time with the Father? As believers, as those of us who've trusted in Him, do we spend a long time with God, trying to align our lives and our hearts with His? As we look and as we jump down, as we, we're going to move forward here, we're going to look at this, what we call the Lord's Prayer. I would say it's the model prayer, a great example for us. We're going to be able to see a few things that we should be doing. If you're physically willing and able, will you stand with me? And what I want to do is, is I'll read my translation in a few moments, but, uh, but I'm going to go on a limb again. Most of us probably, uh, we know the Lord's Prayer. So I want us to, I'll start it, and I want you to just come along with me. I'll continue reading it. We're going to use the King James Version. We're going to go hashtag old school here. But I want us to just say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, be with us as we evaluate the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. You're a great example to us. Lord, help us to pull out the principles and the truths from it and apply it to our personal life on a daily basis, not only seeing how it affects our personal life, but it affects our personal prayer life, but how it affects our life in, in, in striving to be right where you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. My version that I've got in front of me is the Christian Standard Bible, and it's a little bit different. Um, I don't walk around using the words thine in my everyday life. Some of you may. But it says this, Therefore you should pray like this, Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Some translations, uh, some manuscripts don't have all of that in them, and they were added uh, a little bit later. But regardless, we understand the point, and we understand what Jesus was talking about in what we call the Lord's model prayer. But I want us to remember just a few things from this, and, and I don't think that this is a passage. I don't think these words are, are specific for us that we have to use these words when we pray. They're not a bad thing. If you don't have a personal prayer life and you need a starting point, these are really good. These are really good words. It, they're really good to the point that in the second century, in the Didache, they were required to say these prayers, these exact words, three times a day. And if you are not in, in a place in your life where, where you spend a long time with God, then maybe this is a good place. But as we do emphasize the concept of prayer, I want us to remember just a few things. The first is this. As Jesus says, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. The first thing, we need to remember who we are praying to. 
As we're praying, we must remember that we're not praying to some unknown God. We're not praying to some mystical feature, uh, you know, person or whatever. We're not praying to someone that uh, created a religion 200 years ago, God, and we've never heard from again. We're praying and we're talking to the creator of the universe, the one that when he spoke, it was the one who before all he existed. He created you. He knew the number of hairs on your head. He knew you in your mother's womb. This is the creator, the sustainer who we're praying to. And, and Jesus, he gets real personal here in just a minute. But the first thing he says, our Father. As we're praying, we need to remember we're praying to our heavenly Father. Our Father. The beginning, he, he talks about this creates a sense of unity. He, he's reminding them, I believe, to the disciples. Remember, he's teaching the disciples, and, and they all come from different walks of life. There were a couple sets of brothers, and probably within that. But he says what? Our Father. There's a unity that Jesus is emphasizing in the Lord's Prayer. That as believers in Christ, not just as Schindler Drive Baptist, not just as a 3100 Florida Baptist or the 47,000 Southern Baptist churches, but all of us across denominational life as believers in Christ, there's a unity that we have as an essential that we have as our Father, our Heavenly Father. Jesus is clear, our Father. When we hear the word Father, though, and, and I, we can't get past our context, we can't get past our earthly context. We hear, when I hear the word Father, it gets real personal. When I hear the word Father, I think I am a father. I have three daughters, 13, 11, and 6. Yeah, you can say that again. Herbert. Can you pray for me? Black Friday. <clears throat> and be a greeter at Lowe's, make some extra money for the clerk. Right? As a father, I tell my children, and I believe I'm 100% accurate with this, I'm going to let them know. I am not perfect. <laughs> my dad wasn't perfect. I strive to be perfect as a father. But our earthly perspective, we understand that I'm going to fail. And my kids know I'm going to fail. And if I went around the room, there's no doubt if we all spoke of our perception when we hear the word dad or father, there's no telling our thoughts or misconceptions that would be out there. Or our context, our experience of father. So when Jesus says our father, we have to go to his context. He's talking about God, the Father, the creator, the sustainer of all. And we have to get to that place when we understand, when we get to pray and we spend time with God, the Father, when we spend time talking to him, we are talking to our heavenly Father. Just a few traits uh, attributes, so to speak, and this is not an exhaustive list. We don't have enough time. I mean, Herbert told me to finish by twelve fifteen, so we don't have quite an. <coughs> Making sure you're listening. A few attributes. First, our Father, our Heavenly Father, is personal, and our God is a personal God. He loves us. He adores us. He hurts when we hurt. He desires for us to be in relationship with Him. He is a very personal God. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we lump Him into a, a um, we get into metaphors that I'm not comfortable with, and, and we treat God like a teddy bear. Like He's there just for when we're bad, just to comfort us, or when things aren't good. That's not true. Our God is a very personal God, and He loves, and He redeems us, and He, and he sent His Son, Jesus, on the cross. That's the greatest, most personal act that He could ever do for us. Our God is also a loving God. I mean, He's so loving. Romans 5, verse 8, while we were still sinners. 
He's not an ogre who terrifies with, with hideous cruelty, nor the kind of father we sometimes read or hear about, autocrat, playboy, or drunkard, but he himself fulfills the idea of fatherhood and his loving care for his children. Our father is powerful. God is extremely powerful, and I think it's evident. And, and I think, see, it, when, the church, the best thing we can do, the first thing we can do is make sure that we get our doctrine of God right. And Jesus, great example in the Lord's Prayer, what does he say? The first, our Father in heaven. That's the powerful God that we serve. That's the powerful God that loves and redeems us. The, fa- the powerful Father that created everything. And I told the earlier service, I am a horrible creator. I, my six-year-old loves to play with Play-Doh, right? She likes to make things and shape things. I am terrible. She's way better than me. And she tells me all the time. And they remind me, I've got this thing when I was in like second or third grade, when I was in elementary school, you know, you make that thing in art with ceramics and you put it in the kiln and you make it hard and it's supposed to be a dinosaur. But it looks like some type of morphing dog, cat, cow thing. And you use your fingers to do the scales and I don't, I, it, it's terrible. I mean, it's, it's so, they make fun of me. But the powerful God that we serve, he's spoke and he created the world he spoke and it was that's the powerful god that we serve we also we see that our god is holy jesus says your name be honored as holy earlier we said it together hallowed be your name that word means set apart for sacred purposes the name of the lord should be set apart from all others by setting apart god's name we're declaring that he is sacred that he is holy do we spend time do we treat god with that kind of holy reverence i get concerned that we don't that we treat our father our heavenly father as just a lifeline We sang about it earlier, a good, good father. He is a good, good father. As we pray, as Jesus is teaching, he's also teaching us that we, how to remember our priorities. That our priorities should be what? Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we're spending time in prayer, here's the thing. And we can look at all the different methods, the SOAP mechanism or the ACTS method, method, you know, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, all these things. And and that's a great one because so we're asking for things at the end. But if we were to be honest, those of us who do spend time with prayer, and I'm guilty of this, man, I can do a, a great job creating a list of things I need God to take care of for me. But do we spend time in prayer with the first thing, understanding this, his will first, our will second. Because in in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus is teaching us, what's he saying? Your kingdom come, your will be done. See, in Luke 18, uh, the rich young ruler, a ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, no one is good but one, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Honor your father and mother. I've kept all these things from you, from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he told him, you still lack one thing. So all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Now, I don't think the intent was just to get rid of everything. I don't think that's a context for us today. I mean, we live in America, and there are things that we need, and we need to be good citizens. But I think the intent is this, putting Christ first in our life. When Jesus is talking to us about how we pray, how we spend time with the Father, His will first. D.A. Carson, again, to, to reference his book, it says this, We need to realize that if we're praying that God's will be done on earth, we're committing ourselves to two important responsibilities. First, 
of all, we're committing ourselves to learning all we can about his will. This means sustained and humble study of scriptures. We need to know the themes of Zechariah and Galatians, how the portraits of Jesus painted by Matthew and John differ. When we study God's will, we learn that we can take the, the prompted improvements in our lives and apply them each and every day. The second thing he says is this. It's a responsibility. If my heart is that God's will be done, then praying this prayer also pledges that. So help me, God, by his grace, I will do his will as much as I know it. I spent a lot of time with our college students across the state in youth ministries. I'm going to be in Orlando this weekend. And a lot of young people are trying to figure out, what does God want me to do? Total legitimate question. And let me tell you something, young people. A lot of times, you, we, the, 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 there's a perception that you're the only one seeking that. That's not true. The rest of us are, too. We're all trying to figure out, what does God want me to do next? And when you're trying to figure out your career, does God want me to go to this college? Does God want me to marry this, this boy or girl? Not until you're 25 or 30. At least in my house, they can date when they're 25, so whatever. But here's the deal. It's not a time to laugh. When we're seeking God's will first... He's going to lead us to what he desires for our life. I wish he could Snapchat it to you or send you a direct message on Instagram. But when we seek his will first in prayer and in his, in his word and with his people, he's not going to contradict scripture. He's going to lead you where you want to go. That's the same true for every one of us. If we are aligning our lives and our hearts with him, remembering his will first and our will second, we'll be able to follow his path for our lives. The last thing I want us to look at is this. As we're spending time in prayer, as Jesus is teaching, he says what? Remember what you've been given. He says, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We've been given our necessities. When Jesus was teaching, and he's talking to this, he's talking to a group of people that they had a different context than we do, right? They didn't go to the grocery store and buy groceries for a week. They didn't have a refrigerator. They went every day to the market. And if you've ever been to a country where that's the way of life, you understand what I'm talking about. And Jesus is no doubt, that's how these people lived but they also more than likely had a context of understanding the Israelites and the reality that God provided and rained down manna from heaven on a daily basis. And here's the thing. This aligns right with Matthew 6, a little bit later, when he's talking about the cure for anxiety, how we should uh, be focused on today. Don't worry about tomorrow. And I know that's hard to do as we all have calendars and they're synced up with all kinds of things, but the reality is if we... Focus on today. We focus on what God wants for our life and focus on his kingdom first. We understand that God has provided the necessities for us right now, that he has given us an opportunity to live with a peace that he is in control, that Jesus loves and adores you, that Jesus paid the penalty for your sins on the cross, and that you can spend eternity with him in heaven. He gives us our necessities. He gives us forgiveness and forgive us our debts. He has. Earlier I talked about the gospel truth, right? The fact that if we understand that we are sinners separated from God, and we surrender our heart and our life to Jesus, understanding that through the brokenness in this world, that God sent his son, Jesus, to die for you, you can have the ultimate forgiveness of your sins. By believing in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. But I think there's another thing, too, is that it's Jesus' words. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. We have been forgiven our sins, which should lead us to forgive others. We're at in family times and all the things that happen, Thanksgiving and Christmas and over the next few weeks. We're going to be around people that Maybe we need to apply this to. In my life, the hardest person I have to walk through with this is my father. There's some things that happened um, over the past 15, 16 years. 
and my siblings, they don't want to talk to him. They, there's some things that we walk through. But when my dad, he reaches out to me and he calls me, personal confession, I don't want to answer. About the third ring, I remember this every time. God forgave me. I'm a wretched sinner. Like Paul said in 1 Timothy, worthy, I'm not worthy of the forgiveness and the love that God has given me. And when I read this, I think about the forgiveness that we've been given. So we need to forgive those in our life. Forgive, you know, building a heart up of, of a, holding a grudge creates a wall in our heart. And I think when Jesus talks about this, as we have also forgiven our debtors, we do that because we remember that we've been forgiven. And the last thing he says, I think is the beauty uh, of what Jesus has done on the cross. We've been given deliverance. In verse 13 he said, And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Romans 6, verse 17 and 18, Paul writes this, But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching you were entrusted to, and having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness through the blood of Jesus. Jesus is teaching this. He says, before he gave his life on the cross, he says, and remember, and bring us into temptation, but de- and bring us, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He knew he was going to go to the cross, shed his blood, and pay the price from our sins. And here's the thing. We have been delivered from being slaves to sin. And we have been enslaved to righteousness. Jesus is teaching, and there are so many things. In verses 5 through 8, he teaches how to pray, and he talks about some mechanics. And then he gives a great example, starting in verses 9 through verse 13. He focuses on three big things. Remember who we're talking to. We're talking to the creator, the sustainer of the world, of the universe, who loves and adores you. We're talking to someone and that when we remember our priorities, he's going to give us the desires of our heart because our desires become his desires. Remember, his will first, our will second. And then we have to remember always what we have in the Lord. We have forgiveness, we have the necessities, and we have deliverance from our sins. As we wrap up our time this morning, I just want to extend an invitation to several groups of people. There's one group in this room, if you've never gotten to a place where you've surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus. We've talked about the blood of Jesus, how he shed uh, his blood on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins. If you're trying to figure all that out, and that's kind of a foreign thing to you, I know Pastor David, Pastor Hurd, Pastor Ben, if Michelle's around, any of the leaders in this church, they would love nothing more uh, than to begin with you a journey of you understanding the gospel. And the fact that Jesus loves you and desires for you to be in right relationship with him and the Father. Maybe you're here and you're a believer and maybe you don't have a prayer life. Maybe this morning it's a time for you to begin spending time alone with the Father. Maybe you've forgotten who we get to pray to or your priorities have become so out of rank where they need to be. Maybe this is a time and an altar for the Lord to work in and through you. Maybe you're here and, man, you you see that this church is all about community. It's all about serving the Lord. It's all about teaching God's word and loving people and helping them grow in their walk with Christ. Maybe this morning it's a time for you to join this body of believers moving forward on how you can begin, begin and, and continue in your discipleship life. The leadership and the staff of the church would love nothing more than to begin that journey with you. This morning, what I'm fixing to do is I'm going to pray, and Herbert's going to come up, and they're going to sing, and they're going to play, and we're going to stand, and we're going to sing together. And if the Lord is working in and through you, if there's some things you need to deal with, and the Lord let work in and through you, or maybe you need to begin that journey of trusting in Christ, know that this altar, this time of response, this time of invitation is available for you. Let me pray for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to spend time in your word. 
I thank you for the truth, Lord, that you love us beyond what we can ever really love you. And I praise you, Lord, for the fact that you've given your son on the cross for our sins. So, Lord, if there are people in this room that need to begin the journey of trusting in you as the Lord and Savior of their life, I I pray that they would do so today. Maybe not just right here at this altar. Obviously, the invitation time, this front is for them, but maybe even afterwards, if they just want to grab one of the leaders of the church and just say, I need to begin a journey of trusting in Jesus. But I pray also for those who need to let you work in and through them this morning. Maybe it's through uh, jump-starting their prayer life, or maybe it's through remembering who they get to talk to. Lord, it's so overwhelming and, and amazing that we get to spend time with you. And Lord, I pray for those, if they desire to join this fellowship this morning, I pray that they would desire to do so. Come forward and just say, I want to join with Shane. And let this church help me grow in my discipleship way. So Lord, whatever you're doing in the hearts and the lives of these people, Lord, I pray that they would be submissive to that and surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.